Okay. Uh, so I want to start just by thanking, you know, the diverse team of collaborators who've really supported this project. And my research group has been so fortunate to piggyback on a much larger um, Phragmites control project, which has taken what would have otherwise been probably a series of small scale plot experiments and lab experiments and allowed us to really ramp that up to the kind of scale that's relevant to practitioners. And so that's been a real treat for me. Um, and also uh, to thank Janice and Brittany, who's been troubleshooting all of my bad connectivity issues today, and I'm sure the 119 other participants' technology problems. So congrats <laughs> on, uh, I think things are running pretty smoothly. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today, conscientious of the time, I'm gonna focus on two of our main monitoring objectives that we've had since sort of joining this project in 2016 which has been first to look at what's the efficacy of this glyphosate-based Phragmites control project in Long Point and Rondo. Um, and when I say efficacy, I'm really talking about two aspects. I'm concerned about the suppression of Phragmites australis, so how good of a job does the treatment do at eliminating Phragmites? I won't use the word eradication, but um, at reducing its density, its coverage, its spatial extent, its footprint on the landscape. And then the other piece, which is you know, just as important, but much less commonly reported on, is the recovery of the native plant community. And that's a really important objective of this uh, program and a motivating factor for the program in the first place is to support the recovery of uh, species at risk, including a variety of native plant species. And then we were also really concerned about um, any potential risk that applying glyphosate um, and aquasurf, the associated surfactant, over standing water might have on aquatic biota. And so we wanted to um, also carefully track any dispersal of glyphosate and how quickly it degrades in the receiving environment. So we were looking for areas of maximum exposure risk, um, how far it travels from the point of application, and whether it accumulates in the receiving environment. And again, most of this is motivated uh, by concern around the effects that Phragmites was having on species at risk and um, the need to control it in order to achieve some of the uh, you know, recovery strategies. So um, I'm gonna talk a first about efficacy and second, a little bit about dispersal and degradation. And uh, most of the efficacy work I'm gonna talk about is the long-term monitoring plots we've been tracking since before the aerial application of glyphosate took place in the fall of 2016. And um, so before the treatment took place, in the summer of 2016, we went out and set up um, plots where we could monitor the vegetation in areas that were going to be treated, and then paired those with um, monitoring plots in areas that were going to be left alone. And this is really important in monitoring um, the effects of an intervention like this, because, um, you know, for example, in the time since 2016, lake levels in Lake Erie have gone up every single year. And without control plots to compare to, we can't really say whether, you know, the observed success that this treatment project has had is totally due to the glyphosate or how much has the, you know, role of higher water levels really played. And so having those control plots has allowed us to take a really scientific approach to testing um, this question of uh, glyphosate suppression efficacy. So we used what we call a before after control impact design study. So we have sampling before any treatment took place at both these um, what I call control locations, so that's where no herbicide is applied, and treatment locations where we treated the uh, red mites with glyphosate. And um, so we had sites in Rondo and sites in uh, Long Point equally divided between these treatment and control sites. And here you can see a map of the distribution of um, our treatment and control plots in Rondo, where they treated in 2016 by aerial application and then subsequent round uh, based treatment um, that John Wild was just describing. And you can see in the blue, the areas that hadn't been treated yet. So the distribution of our plots are all um, either in areas that haven't been treated at all or in areas that were treated aerially in 2016. And we did a similar setup in Long Point 
um, 20 plots in uh, area that was treated aerially in 2016 and 20 plots in a control location that was just treated for the first time last fall. And these are uh, some jitter plots showing the results. So each dot represents the value in one of our long-term monitoring plots. So there's eight, sort of 80 dots per year total. And we go back to those exact same locations using a high precision GPS with um, 10 centimeter accuracy in real time. So we can really locate the exact same location that we sampled and visit that every single year and trace how um, conditions in that plot have changed either following treatment or as a control through time. So on the um, top or left, upper left panel here, you can see live stem density. This is a Phragmites australis, the number of stems per meter squared. And in some of our plots before treatment, you had over 75 live stems per meter squared, which is really dense stuff. Um, and the treatment plots, which are in uh, green triangles, and the control plots, which are in uh, gray circles, were roughly equivalent in terms of stem density. So these little dots, the black ones, represent the average value. This is before any treatment took place. Right away after treatment, you can see 99.7% um, reduction in live stem density in the treatment plots relative to the controls. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, over time, there has been variation in those control plots. And so the actual um, average stem density has been dropping. Um, and I think that's really due to higher water levels. So what I just threw up here is a green line representing um, lake levels in Lake Erie over time. You can see there's a bit of a seasonal pattern. Things get higher in the spring, you go down in the winter. Um, and you can see that every year since 2016, the kind of average lake level has gone up, 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 up. And our frag density, even in our control plots, has gone down a bit but nothing near like what we've seen in the um, treated plots. There has been a little bit of frag regrowth in some of them. Now, this uh, includes sites where follow-up treatment took place. And so you can see follow-up treatment came in and knocked those uh, three plots back down. And then a few other plots starting to have a little bit of regrowth. So you do have to have that follow-up treatment like Eric was describing. Um, total stem density, very similar pattern, but we have a little bit more um, sort of, uh, I guess, remnant standing dead columns of Phragmites. Uh, and this is because although secondary treatment of rolling and mowing took place at all of our plots in um, the Long Point location, it didn't take place in the Rondo location. They were really hoping to get the chance to burn there. And so um, this is kind of also interesting to compare what happens with and without the mowing or rolling secondary treatment. Without the secondary treatment, um, you still have standing dead uh, columns for a couple of years, but really by 2019, we saw um, no difference in total stem density in Rondo and in Crown Marsh, where we had treated at Long Point. And so um, I think, you know, it really is still standing for a couple of years, but it's not like some of the literature values pointed to standing dead columns five years after treatment if you didn't go in and do some secondary control. And I think, again, uh, we have our high water levels to thank in part, but that really sped up the um, decomposition rate and the sort of rate of collapse or, or falling over of those standing dead, 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 standing dead columns. Down here in panel C, we have incident light. Um, and so this is important. This is the percent of light that is passing from the top of the canopy through to either the water or the soil. And the reason this matters is that for native species to recover, from the seed bank, because we weren't planting um, or, or even spreading seed, that the germination of those seedlings is really going to be triggered by light exposure. So if you have a lot of these standing dead columns, they're maybe not growing. Um, the Phragmites could be all dead, but it's still intercepting light. It's delaying the onset of vegetation recovery. And so you can see that over time, we've seen uh, light penetration as a percentage of incident light go up, up, up. And now we have at many of our treated sites, 100% light penetration. We have quite an open canopy. I'll show you some photos in, it in a moment. And then canopy height, uh, just another measure of Phragmites. It being so tall on average, um, about three and a half meters tall in our treatment and our control plots before any herbicide was applied, and then immediately knocked down, going up a little bit again uh, with some recovery of Phragmites. 
um, and then retreatment kind of pushing that average back down, uh, but overall much lower canopy height in our treated or herbicide treated plots. So I think, um, you know, I mentioned the 99.7% reduction in live stem density in the year following treatment. That has really persisted. Uh, we, like I said, had a few plots with some Phragmites grow back in, uh, but even three or four years later, we're still at 95% lower stem density in the treated plots. And just visually, it's so apparent. Before treatment took place, remember this area looked just like the top figure. You know, you couldn't walk through it at all. And now it's just completely opened up floating marsh, uh, shallow open water marsh with a lot of submerged aquatic vegetation, a lot of diversity of native plants, uh, very different habitat value. And I can sort of describe this part of the uh, pattern in lake level um, by superimposing this on some of those earlier jitter plots, but you can see that this trend has been going on for a while. So a lot of the frag expansion that took place in the Long Point and Rondo region, we think traces its sort of, you know, um, I, what's the word, the, the steepest slope at the rate of expansion took place in um, the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, we had some really low water levels and water levels have been going up and up and that has been a huge help to us, I think. Um, more open water uh, has been created because of that, but also it's really hindered um, re-invasion by Phragmites in our treated areas. And it doesn't seem to have prevented uh, native species from moving in. Uh, however, the type of native species that have moved in are much more um, submerged aquatic vegetation, floating vegetation, and a lot less emergent. So we're not seeing recovery of sedges. We're not seeing you know, expansion of meadow marsh at all. Um, but that I think has a lot to do with the high water levels and not so much to do with Phragmites. And this is just uh, confirming that in our plots, um, our plots reflect the overall pattern in lake level. So we've seen an increase in the water level in our plots, and it's the same pretty much in our treatment and our control plots. But what about native species recovery? Well, this is a bit slower. <laughs> so um, initially we saw a reduction in total species richness in our treated plots from what was already a pretty low um, level. This is the number of plant species, including native and non-native species present in our plots. And as you know, Phragmites tends to be a monoculture. So we have a lot of plots that have one or two vegetation species in them only. Um, and then after herbicide was applied, the average richness actually decreased in our treated plots. And then over the sort of following three years, we've seen some recovery. So by 2020, we do have a few more uh, plant species in our plots on average than um, in the untreated control plots. Uh, another sort of index of biodiversity, the Shannon Meaner Diversity Index shows similar pattern. Um, and we sort of see a similar trend in terms of evenness. In other words, rather than being dominated so strongly by this monoculture of one species, we see a little bit more of a balance um, of uh, species relative abundance in our treated plots. Uh, it's not a huge difference. We thought we were seeing a strong trend here in 2019, but I think that the uh, continued high water levels is, like I said, in very strongly influencing the trajectory of recovery. So we see lots of plots like this, really dominated by a native Hipparis vulgaris um, species, but uh, not, not super diverse from a species richness perspective and pretty low evenness. To relate this to kind of what our targets would be, um, this is, uh, these are measurements on average from 10 plots that we sampled in remnant marsh at Long Point where um, no Phragmites had ever invaded. So it's giving us a bit of a target of what we might be hoping to achieve through the recovery of native species. And you can see we're still falling a bit short of that, um, but uh, I think we're on the right track. Um, in 2019, when I presented to you guys last year after our 2019 monitoring, uh, I reported that we discovered two very distinct um, recovery communities emerging from the uh, sort of the treated plots. And so we had these plots that were never treated, they cluster really distinctively together and they're completely dominated by Phragmites. They haven't really changed despite the increases in water level. 
Um, the plots that were treated are really different, but there are kind of two types of them. They branched off into one type, which was really dominated by native species, and one type that was dominated by non-native species, um, including uh, European frogbit, as well as um, a fair amount of uh, typha, probably hybrid cattail. And so in 2019, you know, over half of the plots that were treated with glyphosate were actually dominated by other non-native species, which is, um, you know, not a great news story. Uh, and I think requires research before we could really talk about, you know, is our, like, for example, European frog better, the impacts of that on native species and species at risk in the marsh equivalent to the impacts of Phragmites. I think the research that I have read suggests that they would not be nearly as severe. Um, so it's still an improvement to get rid of frag and replace it with European frogmint, um, but it's not really achieving our target. And so we had some concerns that we were gonna end up in this kind of undesirable alternative stable state or ecosystem type that's dominated by these other non-native species. But today I get to come and present to you the good news that it doesn't seem like that's happening because in 2020, oh, right, I was gonna say that, we and of course in the great irony of academia, when it takes so long to get papers out, we had literally just received um, a, an acceptance notice on a paper that reports on the first few years of this monitoring days before I'd actually finalized the analysis that I'm presenting to you today. And so I didn't know the good news at that point. Um, but now I can let everybody know that we actually see these native uh, dominated treated plots um, are replacing the non-native dominated treated plots over time. And again, I, I'm gonna attribute this to the high water levels, but I think that we probably need more research to confirm exactly what is driving this transition. Um, but whereas before, if you remember, I'd had mostly uh, the non-native type, uh, 20, I think it was 27 non-native plots um, and only 15 native, in 2020, we have way more flipping from this non-native dominated state to the native dominated state. Um, and so uh, gone from about 27 non-native down to um, around 10 non-native in 2020. So we've seen a really, uh, you know, welcome change in the plant community between 2019 and 2020. And to put that on a map, these um, sort of, this is the treated plots only from um, Long Point. So these are all in Crown Marsh. And you can see orange plots representing ones that were dominated by non-native vegetation in 2019, and were still dominated by non-native vegetation in 2020. The green ones were already dominated by native vegetation in 2019 and remained that way. And the purple ones flipped from the undesirable non-native to the desirable native condition. So that's really good news as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then in Rondo, a similar trend where we saw uh, more flipping from um, dominated by non-native to dominated by native, um, with a couple being reinvaded by Phragmites at the north end here, um, one that had been Phragmites in 2019 already, and um, one that went from um, non-native to Phragmites, and one that went from native to Phragmites in 2020. But overall, I think things are really moving in a, in a desirable trajectory. Um, and I think it's the lake levels that we have to thank for this, but there are a lot of questions. So as I said, we saw 17 plots flip from non-native to native, um, one from native to non-native. So we're definitely on the bulk moving in the right direction. And um, the other thing that we noticed in this analysis is that 50% of the treated plots we were sampling in Rondo have wild rice growing in them. And so we're really curious to know whether wild rice um, is helping to drive out some of that uh, European frog bit. And again, I think more research is needed to know, but we don't really have a good sense at all of what determines whether you get a um, community that's going to be dominated by non-natives or by native species once you get rid of the Phragmites. We definitely see a lot more hemi marsh and higher interspersion, which all leads to greater habitat value for the marsh. So good news story coming out of 2020. I know you didn't think it was possible, but um, the Ontario Phragmites Working Group is a good place to present some good news.
And uh, so, as I mentioned, this kind of raises a lot of questions for me as a researcher. I'm really interested to know, like, why is this happening and what controls whether we're going to get what we call secondary invasion, where these other non-natives just come in, or we're going to get that desirable native community that's going to help support our species at risk that we're targeting. I think the high water levels are probably really important. And so we have planned an experiment um, to try to test that, which will sort of manipulate the water level by raising the sea bank up out of the water. So it's almost like we were lowering the lake levels. Um, and this is called a, a marsh organ. You can kind of use your imagination and picture a church organ um, with all of those different heights at slightly different heights. That's what we achieved with the, the marsh organ experiment. Um, and then uh, we're plant we were hoping to do that last summer, but with COVID, we weren't able to get that off the ground. So we're planning to do it this spring. And what we were able to do um, last year to support this work was to do an in the greenhouse seed bank study. And so we collected seed bank samples from um, 60 different plots, uh, some in areas that were treated with herbicide that had been previously invaded, some in areas that were left untreated, so they continued to be invaded by Phragmites, and then others, which we call reference plots, um, these ones in green, which were in areas where no um, Phragmites had actually invaded, so they're sort of remnant uh, marsh habitat. And that represents our sort of desired target. We collected um, samples of sediment from the surface of the, the marsh, um, where the sea bank would be most concentrated, and then we grew these up under two different conditions in the greenhouse, some of which, which are flooded by three to four centimeters of water, and some of which are kept moist, um, more like the conditions you'd find in like the meadow marsh, where you'd see more grasses and um, more goldenrod and things like that. So we grew these, we're, we're, grow we're still growing these up, but I have some preliminary results to share with you. Um, and the first thing is that we definitely have um, higher, seed bank concentration in our um, Phragmites invaded habitat, even after treatment, um, compared to the reference marsh. The reference marsh sites had less uh, overall emergence of seedlings. Um, in the flooded conditions, we saw zero emergence of Phragmites seedlings, whereas in the moist but non-flooded conditions, uh, we saw from the control plots where no treatment had taken place, 70% of the seedlings that emerged were Phragmites. So it's it, where we haven't treated yet, there's a lot of Phrag in the seed bank and it's waiting for the right conditions in order to sprout. But in the areas where treatment took place, um, and those were all sites that were treated in 2016, so now it's been a few years, only 4% of the seedlings that emerged were Phragmites australis. Um, and so that does show that it doesn't take too long for the viability of Phragmites in the seed bank to start diminishing. And I think, um, it's excitingly, the level of Phragmites in the seed bank in these treated sites was equivalent to what we saw in the reference sites that hadn't been invaded. So that's another really good news story. So I think this in part confirms that the high water levels are partly why we've seen such low reemergence of Phragmites. Um, in the treated areas and also promises that if we can just keep Phragmites out for three or four years, um, we really do get back to what's more similar to a reference seed bank with a lot less of uh, Phragmites viable propagules in the seed bank. Okay, one of the other questions we wanted to ask around um, the relative efficacy of uh, ground-based versus aerial application. And so this just sort of addition to the study we brought in in um, 2018 after uh, a certain part of Crown Marsh was treated aerially and another part was treated uh, by ground in 2017 in the fall. And what we were able to do was set up additional plots the same way that we had um, for, the, for the sort of larger monitoring program, um, but distributed in uh, paired uh, by water depth distributed in marsh that was treated by aerial application versus by ground application. And this was the first time that we um, really did extensive ground application in as part of this project. And um, so we were still, I think, working out a few methodological kinks. Um, and what we found was that overall, the um, 
compared to control plots, <laughs> the aerial application got us down to that 99.7% reduction that we'd seen in the 2016 results. So that seemed really consistent. Um, and the ground-based treatment was more like a sort of 40 or 50 percent reduction in stem density. Um, and, but with a little bit of follow-up treatment, uh, that came down in 2019 and it came down again further in 2020. And we're definitely equivalent to aerial at this point. And some of the changes that um, I think took place that helped uh, achieve better efficacy of suppression on the first pass with ground treatment um, since this study was done have been around improving the water quality because when they're mixing when you're if you're taking water out of the marsh and it has a lot of suspended material in it or has a lot of um, organic material in it because this is pretty shallow organically rich water um, then that's going to reduce the efficacy of your herbicide because a lot of the herbicide is going to get bound up with what's in the water and it won't actually be available to the plants when you spray it. So um, having uh, good filtering and improvements to water quality that goes into the tanks to mix with the herbicide product is really important and that I think has had a big um, influence on this sort of uh, success of ground-based application at the first pass but definitely within a couple of uh, follow-up rounds you're at the same um, level of efficacy that we saw for the uh, aerial application. And so to sort of summarize, um, you know, we found really high efficacy in suppressing Phragmites australis between 99.7 uh, and 95%, even after four years. And in some of those plots, we had just a single application and still, you know, we're not seeing any recovery even four years later. Um, although in other areas, we have had follow-up treatment and, and that's been really important in preventing um, sites that had remnant Phragmites in them from redistributing Phragmites into the surrounding marsh. Um, secondary treatment like rolling and mowing may speed up the recovery of native plants by you know, increasing the amount of sunlight that's penetrating. But um, with the high water levels, I'm not sure that it's made such a huge effect. And within three or four years, we really saw all that, um, those Phragmites stems falling down naturally in the marsh at Rondo. We are, huge proponents of long-term monitoring. Uh, we've been doing this now four years post-treatment. We're gonna go out and sample again this summer if uh, COVID permits. Um, I think it's really important to keep monitoring because we're learning new things all the time. Um, and if we had stopped last year or the year before, we wouldn't have realized that that secondary invasion seems to be being beaten back and maybe wild rice is playing an important role um, in that native uh, recovery, which is, of potential importance from a sort of cultural perspective because of the cultural value and the traditional value of um, wild rice as a species. Uh, we also, as I said, paired all of our treatment and control plots by water depth and sampled across a water depth gradient, and we never found any effect of water depth on the efficacy of Phragmites suppression. Uh, but it does seem to have an important role to play in the recovery with higher water, again, preventing germination of Phragmites seedlings from the seed bank. Um, and influencing the type of vegetation that comes back. The concern that I uh, mentioned around secondary invasion really seems to be um, maybe a temporary uh, concern that with ha continued high water levels is, um, is, is receding. And um, the initial ground-based application had lower suppression efficacy than aerial, but it didn't take long to catch up. So the second objective I wanted to talk about has to do with the risk of um, exposure to glyphosate, whether it's accumulating in the um, environment where it's been applied and with subsequent treatments. And I've presented on this in great detail in previous meetings. And I think there's also maybe um, at least one presentation for uh, the Great Lakes Collaborative um, webinar series that you guys can go and check out. Uh, so I'm just gonna very quickly go over that. We did publish a paper on this. Um, it came out in 2020 and it reports on the first couple of years of results. And um, so this is just repeating things I've told this audience before, but the glyphosate does not reach concentrations that are of any ecological concern in the water or in the sediment. Um, following the use of uh, Roundup Custom over water for Phragmites control, 
And mostly, at least in the water, it's gone within 20 days, although we did see some um, residue persisting in the sediment uh, for up to two years. It doesn't disperse very far from the point of application. Um, so I think the furthest we'd ever seen it travel from the point of application was about 50 meters. And that was when it was uh, at a high dose through aerial application. Um, so in 2020, we continued to monitor uh, areas of new treatment because the follow-up treatment, of course, is um, the loading on like a an individual plant would be the same regardless of whether it's follow-up or it's initial treatment. But from a spatial perspective, there's fewer plants that are at lower density. So you're adding a lot less glyphosate per meter squared when you're doing follow-up treatment. So from a maximum exposure risk perspective, we're really interested in new treatment areas where the Phragmites is still dense. Um, and so a lot more herbicide is being used. And we did our, uh, repeated the pattern of collecting data on water and sediment quality before treatment takes place within 24 hours of the herbicide application, and then again, 30 days later. And the results from last year were really in line with what we've reported before. Just for your reference, the um, concentration in the water was uh, between 0.18 and 0.23 parts per million, which compares to, uh, sorry, 0.018 to 0.023 parts per million, which compares to 0.8 parts per million for the long-term protection of aquatic life. That's the threshold that the Canadian Council for Ministers of the Environment has published. So we're, we're you know, an order of magnitude uh, below any threshold of concern, even for the long-term protection of aquatic life. These are pretty low trace levels that we're talking about. Oh, and then um, I just really wanted to promote this, like, because this is such a beautiful piece of art. This is an oil painting um, that was done by this fantastic local artist, Amanda Rodingser. And this is two of my first, these are both of my first ever PhD students sampling in the Crown Marsh um, in an area where Phragmites had been removed. And you can just see what a transformation it's had on the marsh. Um, and now uh, it's much more hemi marsh and open and fantastic habitat values for waterfowl and all sorts of critters. Um, and so this feels to me like an enormous success. I wanted to share that image with you guys and then uh, I guess entertain any questions. Stop sharing. That seems to have worked. I don't know if I still have time, Janice. Um, native Frank Mind is not covering. So we, uh, we have not. Are you going to cut me off or should I answer some right, questions? Go ahead and answer some questions because it's pretty important that you, I think have you heard to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the top rated one here was around native Phragmites, and we've seen native Phragmites out um, in the Long Point Marsh, um, more out towards the tip in the um, Long Point National Wildlife Area. We haven't really seen any in Crown Marsh, um, so we haven't encountered any in our plots. Um, whether introducing native Phragmites could be part of the restoration, I think uh, if you venture into the realm where you're, you're going to use seeding and planting as part of your recovery strategy, then um, you really do want to take a careful look at all of the native seeds that would be options and um, take what, what I would recommend is to look at the functional traits of those plants and to try to put together an a, assemblage of seeds that represent a community that's going to have functional traits that are um, sufficiently diverse to resist subsequent invasion by Phragmites. And there's a lot of literature on um, how you can do that uh, sort of theoretically, but I don't think anyone has applied it to Phragmites and certainly not in freshwater systems. Um, is this recovery pattern statistically significant? Yes. Uh, yes, so we, we do see significant um, changes in the community composition. The richness and the Shannon Wiener diversity index are not significantly higher but they're also not really significantly different than what we see in reference marsh community. So um, the patterns of statistical significance are definitely there from a community composition perspective. And we are seeing, like I saw, uh, like I described the emergence of these two very distinctive communities in um, treated plots, uh, either dominated by native uh, plants or dominated by uh, non-native plants. 
Do you see, do you have an understanding of the need of vegetation that was in the area before? Uh, well, we do and we don't. I mean, there's some historic records. There was uh, Paul Catling and I think even Tony Resnicek did a really amazing flora, maybe in the 1980s, that documents the um, diversity of plants, but we don't really have sort of compositional data around the relative abundance in these specific plots. Um, we do have, though, uh, these remnant patches of vegetation where Phragmites hadn't yet gotten around to invading, and those can also be used as a bit of a yardstick. So those are the plots that I was describing as reference. Is this research sponsored by chemical producers? No, not at all. Um, most of the funding supporting this research has come from our partnership with MNRF. Um, and then I also have uh, funding from um, the National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada through my personal discovery grant, um, which supports my research program at the University of Waterloo. And then we've had lots of different scholarships support the many students who've worked on this project from NSERC, from MITAX and, and other partners. So, um, and most recently we've been uh, partnering with Maine and Wildlife Services um, and Heather Braun's team uh, to, to work on so, for example, the Marsh Organ Project. So, um, no, we haven't received any funding from any chemical companies. Is there a backy design on water chemistry? Um, I know. Well, actually, yes. Yes, I guess in the sense that we did collect uh, water and sediment from treated and um, untreated areas in a couple of the years of monitoring as part of the larger monitoring program design where we were also trying to look at benthic invertebrates. We never saw any patterns to benthic invertebrates at all, so I didn't take the time to present that today. But where we did do that sampling, we also collected water samples in the reference plots and um, we didn't find glyphosate. Oh, and so we're back sort of conform conforming to expectations. Yeah, and, and you know, you may want to mention, you know, the 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 the, the a project that went on in Rondo where uh, you're looking at, you know, the trace chemicals that from the agricultural inputs, because that kind of helps to yeah. put it in context as well, right? Yeah, yeah, that's totally true, Janice. Thanks. Um, so we also worked in partnership with uh, Christina Davy and Janice and collected a broad suite of water and sediment samples uh, that we tested for I think 120 or 130 different pesticides. And even though we're in a protected park, um, if you look at the larger watershed that drains into Rondo Bay, that's mostly agricultural land. And so there's, uh, there is a background level of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides that are present. Um, but the concentrations are, are relatively low. I think there's a lot of unknowns around how those um, you know, might multiply as cumulative stressors that are all potentially interacting, um, and then how they um, impact wetland food webs, I think is an active area of investigation that we're pursuing um, because we've observed that biofilms in wetlands are really good at cleaning up the water. They provi provide us with this fantastic ecosystem service. But unfortunately, uh, the consequence of that is that they accumulate pesticides and they're um, a good gateway for pesticides at higher concentrations than you'd expect to get into the wetland food web. Yeah, it's an important point. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much. I think if you don't mind, uh, if you can just answer those questions, those be remaining, I, I would appreciate In the chat? It. Yeah, we'll keep going there. Thank you, it's really amazing, awesome research and, and uh, findings, and it's so valuable for us to have that. Thank you so much.